This is our, our third one and, um, and I think our final one, unless, unless another question comes in. But I'm pretty sure uh, next week we're going to be kicking off our fall series. So um, Choose Your Own Adventure, what we've been doing is these are questions you guys submitted over the last couple months. And a little bit different than how I, how I normally teach, but I try to take the question and think about it, talk about it, pray about it, and give an answer. So this week's question is, oh, my clicker is still not working. Janine, did you do this to me again? What do you do when you feel like God has let you down? So that's the question for today. It's definitely not an emotional one. Um, <laughs> so this will be a good one to jump into. And I want to pray before we get started. So if you would join me in praying. God, I thank you that when we're faced with these questions, we can look to Scripture and find answers. We can look to Scripture and find a hope. We can look to Scripture and find direction. So we pray that you would open up your word to us today, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so what do you do when you feel like God has let you down? And I think there's two major ways that we feel like God lets us down. First is you ask God for something and he doesn't deliver in the way or time that you want. And the second one is something bad happens and you can't understand why God wouldn't prevent it in your life. And those are the two major ways that we start to feel like God has let us down. And, you know, we, we're, we're encouraged, especially in the more Protestant and more charismatic type churches like the Vineyard, to think of God as a, not just God who's far away and distant, but God who's up close and personal, even a friend, right? And yet that gets us in trouble because we start to think that that friend should do everything within his power that we want him to do at all times. And so we get personally hurt by God. And it's a real thing. Like, we get upset by God. We get disappointed by God. We get hurt by God. And it's not a new thing, as we're going to see. This is through the Bible. There are different times where people experience this. But I think most of the time it has to do with these two things. You ask God, right? So it can be on a spectrum of, you know, it's kind of smaller, less important to really important things, right? You know, you ask God for a promotion at work or for a new job, and it doesn't come through. And you pray about it, and you, you, you get other people to pray about it, and that it doesn't come through. It's like, God, why didn't you answer my prayer the way that I wanted you to, or maybe in the time that I wanted you to answer it? You know, it can be about one of your kids. Like, we love our kids. Those of your parents, we love our kids most of the time, really deeply. And sometimes you pray for God to do things in their lives, and sometimes he doesn't. Or sometimes they have free will, and they make choices that you don't understand. And you're like, why, God, did I have so many? Just kidding, that's not what you say. You say, God, why aren't you answering my prayer for my kids? Right? Why aren't you moving in their lives the way that I'm asking you to? Some of you have kids who maybe aren't even following God right now. And you're, you're like, what could be a more perfect prayer than God help my child to find you, Jesus? And yet, it's not always an, a one plus one equals two situation. Some of us have suffered loss. Some of us have suffered tragic loss. And that's where we feel like, God, where were you? Why did you let that happen to my loved one? Why did you not save that person's life? Why did you not intervene as that person spiraled down into depression? Where were you, God? And this is a hard topic to talk about because it's, it's emotional, right? There's some things, that questions you could answer, like let's talk about, you know, the veracity of the scripture and how we can trust that what we're reading now is what was written then. And like, that's very intellectual. And, and I love that kind of stuff. This is almost all in our heart. And the thing is, when you're in the thick of it is not the time really to talk about it. Because when you're in the thick of it, it's not, I'm not going to sit down and be like, well, let me share with you from scripture how this all works, right? Like, when you're in the thick of crisis, of disappointment, of grieving, what you need is not theology right then. You just need a person with you. You need someone to walk with you, to hold your hand, to to hold you, to hold your pain with you. But one of the things that I believe in is creating um, an environment where we lay a theological foundation outside of times of crisis so that when times of crisis come, we have a theological foundation upon which to stand. My therapist said it differently. So um, my therapist has talked to me about my kind of addictive personality traits in my life. And she said, you have to do the work when life is going well so that it's there when life is going poorly. You can't wait until you're falling into temptation or falling apart to then decide, oh, I better do the work on my life. You got to do the work when life is going well. So right now, unless you're in crisis, which you might be, 
But for the most of, most of us, we're, we're, we're in different phases where this isn't maybe happening right now. We feel let down by God for something in the past or maybe something's going to be coming. And I want to talk about what the Bible says so that you and I can have theological muscle so that when that comes against us, we can stand. It's, and and the, the theology of like the, the counselor, you know, that therapeutic deism, right? Like that counselor in the sky who, gives you, who just wants you to be happy and gives you everything you want. That theology will break as soon as life hits you in the face. If you expect God to give you what you want when you want it, to make you happy, if you think God's number one goal is to keep you happy, your concept of God is going to break upon the rock of suffering that's going to come in your life at some point. And we've all been there and we'll all be there again. And so we need a more robust theology. And the thing that's amazing is Scripture is much more uh, deep and, and nuanced and able to handle the hard things of life. Okay, so that's what I want to talk about today. We get to these situations where we're like, where are you, God? Why did you let this happen? And it feels personal to us, doesn't it? And so I want to first look at why does this bother us so much? Have you ever thought about that? Like there is a way of thinking about God where this wouldn't bother you. Like if you just thought about God as being kind of distant and sovereign and things just happen and you just have to get through it, you probably wouldn't get so upset. But like I said, we have more of a personal relationship with Jesus and so it bothers us. But I think there's two things that might help us frame it, why it bothers us so much. First is we come face to face with our limitations. So when you, like you, you and I kind of going through life in our normal Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we fall into the lie, the illusion that we have control over what's happening in our lives. And I know you don't want to hear that, that it's an illusion. And we don't think it. We don't actually cognitively think I'm in control, but we live like it. We, think, we, we live like we can kind of control what happens in our life until something happens that's outside of our control. Until there's an injury, or until there's an you know, economic downturn, until you know, a loved one suddenly passes away, until we get laid off and we had no idea it was coming, all of a sudden we realized, I don't have any control over anything. I can't control keeping my body healthy. I can't control keeping my job. I can't control providing for my, I mean, I can work hard, but I really can't control any of this stuff. And it, it's, we get faced with this limitation. We get faced with our humanity. We get faced with our mortality, and we start to realize we need help. And this is why I think it's so much, people cry out to God when life gets hard more than they do when life is okay because they start to buy into the lie that they're doing good. And the thing is, we're always one decision or one tragedy or one bad turn away from realizing we're not in control. Think about it. Jesus said, why do you even worry? You can't add one single hair to your head. I mean, he's not trying to say that you're nothing, right? Like God's, there's a lot of good about us and that's not the teaching series right now. Obviously, we're created in the image of God, and God gives us amazing grace and gifts and power and authority. And we, God, you know, wants to work with us in building the kingdom of God on earth. I believe all that, but when it comes down to it, you can't add a single day to your life. We, we can't. You can't guarantee that the people you love will follow Jesus, that they will stay healthy. You can't guarantee that you'll have enough money. You can't guarantee that the person you love right now will love you back. I'm pretty convinced we've been together for 25 years, but I have no control over Mandy. Trust me. <laughs> I have tried bribery. I've tr <laughs> you have no control over your kids. Anybody have kids? Do you think you have control over them? Once they turn like, I don't know, when they're babies for a little while maybe, but like that first crying night, you're like, oh my gosh. This person has a mind of their own, and they're like three weeks old, and they're already winning. You know, like, that's like, that's life, you know? And, and so I think what we, then what we do is we're like, okay, either we're like, I need help from something bigger, or I need to blame something bigger. But it definitely points us towards God. And the second thing is, I think that we all know that this isn't how the world's supposed to work. Somewhere inside of us, in fact, Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes, this is, if you're not familiar with the Bible, I'm actually going to be jumping around a little bit today from different parts of the Bible, and I'll try to keep you clued into where we are. So this is in the Old Testament, and if you've heard of King David, David and Goliath, this is David's son, wrote this book, Ecclesiastes, which is a very complicated book, but it's wisdom literature in the Old Testament. And he says that he's made everything beautiful in its time, and he has set eternity in the human heart. 
There's this sense that we know, we know people, I mean, if I'm just going to be honest, we know people shouldn't die. Like, have you ever lost a loved one? And it's just like, this isn't right. There's something wrong with death. There's something wrong. Have you ever seen the body of a loved one after they've passed away? This is, it's like, that's not even them anymore. Like, this is not how it's supposed to be. Something inside of us knows we're not supposed to be suffering. We're not supposed to be sick. We're not supposed to be heartbroken. There shouldn't be injustice. Like you look at poverty and you think this isn't how it should be. And the thing is, it doesn't really bother us if we're being really honest until it gets close to home. And then when it gets close to home, we're like, this is wrong. But this is why it gets us so upset. When something bad happens, it's an indication like we, it's like, okay, it's like a warning light in your car, right? Like you're driving your car and then the warning light comes on to tell you that something's wrong. That's what happens inside of us. We get, we get indignant. We get upset. We're like, this, someone should do something about this. And so we look to God. We're like, God, do something. What we really mean is God, do something in my situation. Do something for me. But I want to just talk about for a little bit that God exists so much farther outside of my personal issues. This is a quote from a book series that I love. I'm not going to promote it or tell you what it is. It's a fictional, fictional book series that has nothing to do with God. But to the pure, all things are pure, okay? And so as I read this book series, I see Jesus in it all the time. Can I get an amen? Amen. Thank you very much. So I, this quote has always stuck with me. It's an old book series. I've read it three times now. He says, and they say, a fool pulls the leaves, a brute chops the trunk, but a sage pulls up the roots. And I feel like we want God to pull the leaves. We want God to just fix our problem right here. <laughs> fix our problem. And we don't really think about the bigger scale, but where God exists is looking at not just your problem, yes, but everyone's problem, your neighbor's problem, and then their problem, and their problem, and then outside of Delaware and outside of the United States. On our missions trip, we met this lady named Myrna. Myrna. I never say her name. Myrna. There. This is like, this is happening outside of my field of knowledge. And this is just a story to give one small example of how much evil there is in the world that you and I are unaware of. And then when it knocks on our door, we're like, why me, God? Right? Mirna started noticing in this kind of impoverished area of Mexico that there were children not being taken care of. And so she opened up her home to these kids. And she built bunk beds in her home so the kids could sleep there. And she gradually, accidentally became a shelter. Ten kids live in her home now. And she wants to buy the property next to it and blow out the wall and expand the thing so she can have more kids live there. There are kids there whose parents are in prison. There are kids there whose parents work in the field so they don't get back in time to take care of them. There are kids there who don't have enough food. And so she feeds 50 families every weekend, two meals that's one person. And that's just like, I didn't know about that. That's the danger with like expanding your horizons in the kingdom of God is there's so much out there. But God knows about that, doesn't he? I was at the national conference this week for vineyard pastors and leaders, and we were talking about unreached people groups. And then there's this, so I, apparently if you're in the know, UPG, Unreached People Group, and then there's UUPG, which is, oh, I should have thought of it before I said that. <laughs> Unreached People Groups and, oh, I don't know what the U is. Do you know it? No, it's not Uber. Okay. <laughs> it's whatever, it, it's a word that means that there's, the Bible isn't in their language. There's nothing there. There's no, 0% Christian. So Unreached People Groups is less than 2% Christian in that area. And whatever the other U is, which it just escaped my mind once I said it, means 0% Christian in that area. No Bible translated in their language. Okay? And there's like, Hundreds of thousands of people living in that situation right now, even in our world today. Did you know that? I didn't know that. 
There are like literal tribes who haven't heard of God yet, who don't have a Bible in their language. And there are Christians who think this is important, and they're raising money and traveling across the country and risking their lives to do it. We met a couple who spent year, a year in jail because they were preaching the gospel in a country, not preaching it out loud. Like they started an underground church, and they're preaching a gospel, and then they got arrested because they were being Christians and helping other people be Christians in a country where it's illegal. We weren't even allowed to take pictures of them because they, we could get them in trouble. Like it was a secret meeting with 2,000 people watching. It was crazy. But like there's just more out there than just my personal thing. So here's the point I'm trying to make. We were like, where are you, God? And I think God is like, listen, I've already been addressing this. That's kind of what I want to go with as far as a first step, theological foundation. Remember, I'm not saying this is what I would say to you if you were in the throes of grieving, okay? This is not. But I'm just saying, as Christians, what does the Bible teach us about how we deal with evil, suffering, disappointment, frustration, and how we need to understand it is that God hates it more than you do. God is more upset about it than you are. And he's more aware of all of the levels of evil. I might be deeply frustrated that I lost my job, but there are also children being uh, trafficked for sex all over the world right now, and God cares about that too. So what God cares about is he wants to pull up the roots of evil. He doesn't want to just fix my problem. Are you tracking? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let's go back to the beginning and set the stage. And God saw all that he had made, I would argue that he still sees all. Would you agree? So when you and I, we notice the evil right here, he sees all the evil. Jesus walked up, I read this a couple weeks ago, he walked up to the, the hill before Jerusalem and it says he wept when he looked over Jerusalem and said, I wish you would let me save you. Basically, that's Christian's translation. There were a couple of times where Jesus prayed for people for healing and it says he looked up and he sighed. And commentators will talk about this deep moan, like how has my beautiful creation been so corrupted that there's cancer in it and there's pain in it, there's heartbreak and there's racism and there's poverty. And he's like brokenhearted, way more than you and I ever would be because in the beginning he created it and he said, this is very good. It was a perfect garden where man and woman dwell in perfect, hum perfect unity as humans and perfect unity with God and there was no sin or sickness or pain or death or racism or poverty or injustice. But then sin entered. And the Bible tells us, Paul writes in Romans. So now for those of you who are following on, this is in the New Testament. Romans is a letter written by Paul who was one of the earliest disciples, followers of Jesus. And he wrote this to a church in Rome. He said, therefore, just as sin entered the world through the one man, that's Adam, Adam and Eve, right? And death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. So in the beginning, there was this beautiful garden of perfection and relationship and communion. But also, God gave us a choice, gave Adam and Eve a choice, but we all have the same choice, don't we? We have the same choice to let God define good and evil in our lives or to define good and evil ourselves. Isn't that what they did? We want to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We want to be in charge. We want to be God. And we all do this. We're all guilty of sin. And see, I want you to understand, and, like the, and I know for some of us, this is like Christian. I learned this 30 years ago. But listen, the gospel, the very basic gospel message isn't just for when you first accept Jesus. It's every day for the rest of your life. It's upon which all else is built. And so in the beginning was perfection, and sin corrupted it like, like a cancer eating through a body. And so the system we live in right now is broken. Every part of it is broken and affected by sin. Death comes because of sin. Sickness comes because of sin. All the things I've been listening, racism becomes because of sin. Brokenness in relationships comes because of sin. I would argue even natural disasters come because of sin. In the Garden of Eden, before sin entered the world, would there have been natural, natural disasters that killed people? No. But our whole system, and there's biblical support for that that I don't have time to get into, so you can email me if you disagree, right? But it tells us that even creation itself is groaning, waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. 
Right? There's something still, even creation is broken. So how, how did God respond? Because we're like, God, I'm, I'm, I'm so upset. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be upset. But I just want to tell you, God has answered. He is answering and he will answer that cry of our heart that the bad stuff that's happening shouldn't be happening. I want to, I want to affirm that when you get upset, you are lining yourself up with God because God is upset. Here's what I want to try to do in the teaching today is instead of us saying, against you, God. Why don't you do stuff? We join God, and we're like, God is on the move. I want to be on the move with him. So how did God respond? God said, I love you so much, right? I love you so much that I'm going to pay the ultimate price. Let me come fix the problem you started. Let me come heal the wound you inflicted. Let me pay the price that you for the debt that you incurred. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Notice how the choice is still ours now. In the Garden of Eden, or in our lives, we have the choice to choose to walk away from God in the same way. God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. A lot of people like to stop reading the verse there. And they think everyone gets saved, and that's just not the message of the gospel. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So what God does is the ultimate act of love is he doesn't force us to do anything. He gave us a choice in the garden, and he gives us a choice now. And he says, you may choose salvation and life with me, or you may choose to follow your own way. And he's not going to force us to do it. So you see, at, this is going back to Romans, where we were. At just the right time, when we were still powerless. Guys, you and I can't save ourselves from anything, let alone sin and the power of sin in this world. So when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Now listen, I love this argument. Very rarely, someone will die for a righteous person. Okay? That's what he's saying. Like once in a while, someone will die for a good person. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. Again, that theme of love. When we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to get our act together. He didn't wait for us to make the first step. God made the first step. He stepped into our brokenness and rescued us. For the sin of the one man, Adam, caused uh, the death to rule over many, but even greater. Listen to this. This is the good news. This is the gospel message. Even greater is God's wonderful grace. Even greater than our sin is God's wonderful grace. Even greater. Look at the evil of the world. Now just go back to that. Think about the big picture of evil. All of the evil that we see in the world, even greater is God's grace. And what I want to say is like when we cry out to God, we're like, God, where are you? Why didn't you do this or this or this? God's saying, I have answered it, I am answering it, and I will answer it. He sent his son to die on the cross to start this rebellion where the kingdom of God begins to invade the kingdoms of this world because the only answer, like we want him to heal the sick, and he does, raise the dead, and he does, right, to fix poverty, he does through us, right? That's all we believe, the kingdom of God coming on earth. But first, he had to pull up the roots, which is sin. Sin is the source of all those things. So instead of like, The Jews wanted him to come and defeat the Romans. He was like, no, I'm going to come and defeat sin and death because those are really your two enemies. So he did that. He is still doing that through us, the church, and in our lives, and he will ultimately do it when he returns. That's why that whole returning thing is a big part of Christian theology. When he returns, he will wipe every tear from our eye. He will heal every wound. There will be no more crying or pain or sickness or death. Revelation 21, go home and read it. There is a new creation, a new earth, a new heaven that will come and we will all be made new who choose to follow Jesus. That's the ultimate promise. And so when we're faced with these hard times, again, this is a theological foundation. I'm not, I wouldn't say this to you, you know, if, if you called me to come over because something horrible happened. I wouldn't say this. But this is a theological, theological foundation that I don't think that we have a lot of because We're force-fed this therapeutic deism that's just like, God just wants you happy. God just wants you happy. God just wants you happy. But the reality is God sees the brokenness more than we do. And it bothers him. He hates it so much that he's willing to die for it to give us a better future. Amen? You see where we're going with that? Okay. So our personal pain points us to God's promise of salvation. Instead of our personal pain making us enemies of God, blaming God. Because what we do is we tend to push away 
God in the times that we need him most. When we're disappointed, when we're frustrated, when we're hurting, we tend to push him away. But our frustration with this broken world makes us long for a better place. And actually what I'm trying to get you to see, get myself to see, is that frustration, that anger, that righteous anger, that that indignation that there should, it shouldn't be this way is actually not us being mad at God. God, why don't you change it? But it's actually aligning us with what God is already doing in the world. And he's like, I hear you. Like, let's get to work. There's a family in our church who lost their son. And what I've watched them do through their, the year, uh, year and a half since, well, just over a year, is they haven't turned and said, God, why have you done this? We're so mad at you. But they've joined what God is doing, and they're changing their lives to start to help other people whose kids are battling with the same issues. It's, it's really interesting because they see that God is already working, and so they want to join God in that work. Do you see how that can change how we grieve? It can change, like if we have a better theological foundation, it can change how we go through hard times. We can see God is just as upset about this. And I want to join him in what he's doing. So when, what do you do when you feel like God has let you down? What I would just say is tell yourself the truth about God. Because what, what happens to us when we're down, when we're disappointed, frustrated, broken, hurting, grieving, is the enemy loves to come in and lie to us. You know, there's a Bible verse that Peter wrote. Peter, also one of the earliest disciples of Jesus. And he said that the enemy walks around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Have you ever watched a nature show? It's a strange, like, factoid about Mandy and I when we were first dating. We really liked to watch nature shows together. I don't know why. It's just so weird. Nature shows in Seinfeld. That was like, that was it. Back and forth. Um, and I always, I always have thought that at zoos, what zoos are missing is live action, right? Like you look at the animals at zoos and they look so bored and honestly, they're kind of boring to look at. But if they would just release some prey into like the cheetah exhibit, that would be phenomenal. Who wouldn't pay to see that, right? Like every day at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m., we're gonna let a bunch of rabbits in there and just like go for it. I would love that. And that's what I love watching cheetahs especially. But what, you know, you'll watch like a, che- a, a pack of cheetahs hunting a pack of some other animal, antelope? I don't know. And they'll isolate one, especially if they find like one who's hurt. I know this is really sad, but it's the circle of life. Go watch Lion King, okay? And so our enemy, I, I don't think that's an accident that Peter used that analogy. The enemy is always looking for ways to trip us up. But when we're down, he especially, it's not like you get a pass like, dude, I'm, I'm really grieving right now. I'm really anxious right now. I'm going through a really hard time in my life. Would you just leave me alone? He's like, no, actually, I'd like to kill you. This is a good time. And so you shouldn't be surprised at the attack of the enemy when you're struggling. When life is difficult, of course, and what is the enemy's number one way that he attacks us? Lies. He loves to tell us lies. And so we have to tell ourselves the truth about God. That would be my number one recommendation What do you do when you feel like God has let you down? Even the words right there indicate we're starting to believe a lie about God. Because God's not going to let you down. And so can we, instead of blaming God and setting ourselves against him, can we join him? And let's remember these. I have four things real quick. Let's Things we can tell ourselves. This is more of the practical. So we did, we kind of, theological foundation. Practically, number one, Tell yourself the truth about God, that God is for you. When bad stuff happens in our life, our knee-jerk, knee-jerk reaction is to be like, God is against me. Why did God do this? Why did God let it happen? And this is where we remind ourselves the truth about God. God is not against you. Even if you feel it, sometimes, listen, I know this is radical, sometimes you shouldn't listen to your emotions. <gasps> I know it's radical, but like sometimes your emotions are wrong. They are. It's bad advice to follow your heart. It is. Sometimes it's good advice, but sometimes our heart is deceitful and wicked beyond all understanding. So we need to follow the Scripture, and the Scripture says 
What shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? How much is he for us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? And here's where we get tripped up is we want to define those things. <laughs> here's what I would like, God, off the menu of life. No pain, no, <laughs> right? But that's not how it works. So we have to understand, we have to remind ourselves, God is for us. He's not against you. He is always and forever for you. He believes in you. He walks with you. Number two is you can be honest with God. You don't have to put on a happy face. You don't have to look strong. You don't have to fake it. You don't have to act like you've got your life together. It is okay for Christians to suffer. In fact, there's a lot of that in the Bible, okay? It is okay for Christians to cry out to God. And this, this beautiful prayer style that the Bible gives us to help us suffer well. It's called lament. I'm going to read you one of the Psalms of lament. Almost 50%, did you know this, of the Psalms in the book of Psalms are Psalms of lament. Here's one of them. How long, Lord? <laughs> Would you like to pray this sometime? It's okay. Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. This guy is hurting. But this is a justifiable way to pray. The enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. It's okay to be honest with God. Sometimes we need to tell ourselves the truth about who God really is. You know what I notice when we're hurting, when things aren't going our way, is we start to believe things like this. You deserve this. You had this coming. This is because of that thing you did in your past. I knew, it will, I knew God would punish me for it someday. God doesn't do good things for you. Some of us have come to believe that God just doesn't do good things for us. He only does good things for other people. Or this is your lot in life. Like you are a person who struggles. Or this is happening because you blank. You know, I, I, um, I pray for my kids a lot. So, and I pray pretty much every day like for my kids to go through and pray for their salvation. Not their salvation. They're saved. <laughs> Um, nothing wrong with that, but I pray for their relationship with God, is what I meant to say. Pray that they would get closer to God, that they would own that for themselves and wouldn't just do it because of Mandy and I. And I pray for a lot of other things in their life, too, but I also pray for safety a lot. And I, I realize I'm raised in the generation who's, like, overly concerned with the safety of their kids, and we've tried to, like, walk that line. But I definitely pray for safety, especially driving. You know, and I will tell you, if I'm being really honest, that there's a little bit of like a PTSD wound in my, in Mandy and my history, that two of our, one of our best friends and another one of our friends died in a car accident when we were in high school together. And I've always been afraid of my kids driving. And so I pray a lot for that. And so sometimes when I don't pray, I think, oh, I have this, what I call superstitious faith that has nothing to do with the Bible. Well, I forgot to pray. They're going to get in an accident. Do you ever feel that way? I forgot to pray. My kids are going to get sick. Or, like, I didn't, like, I felt like God told me to give that person that thing, and I didn't, so now I'm sure something bad's going to happen. It's like we adopt this weird, like, I don't know. I'm not even going to say that. It's superstition. It's superstitious faith, and it's not in the Bible, and it's not by the character of God. And so I have to remind myself, that's not how God, in fact, one day I want to write a book, because I almost did it in my 20s, but I ran out of time, and then I turned 30. So, um, but a book called God's Not Like That. I would love to write a book called God's Not Like That. There's so many things we believe about God that just aren't biblical. And that's one of them, that God would be like waiting, and as soon as I don't pray, he's like, got your kid, <laughs> right? Like, that's not who God is, you know? Like, I'm just, you know, he's just waiting for me to mess up. That's not who God is, but there's something in me that believes that. We need to remind ourselves of who God is. Worship team, you can come up. And lastly, we just need to remember. Remember, the whole point is, how do we, what do we do when we feel like God has let us down? We need to tell ourselves the truth. Tell ourselves the truth about God. And number four is that God's in the valley. God is and always will be with you in the darkest times of your life. 
You've read it before, you know, Psalm 23, right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, the prowling lion, because who else is there? Right? Because you are with me. And then he like goes crazy and prepares a table in the presence of your enemies, right, in the valley. And he anoints your head with oil and your cup overflows. There's something about meeting God in the valley. And so can I just encourage us to be a people who don't turn their back on God when we need him most? I feel like that's a popular thing to do, to get upset and angry. And what I want us to do is channel that in the right direction and say, yes, you should be upset and angry that bad things happen to you. It would be growth for us also to be upset and angry that bad things happen to other people. And can we understand that God is more upset and angry? God cares way more than you do about what or whatever it is that you're upset about. He, he cares way more. He just does. Evil bothers God so much that he died for it. Have you? Right? Isn't that what it says in the, in the New Testament? It says some of you have resisted, but you haven't resisted to the point of shedding blood. I mean, Jesus basically put his, he put, he went all in. 